How is everybody doing tonight? Welcome to the third installment of April Madness. Happy Earth Day, everybody. We are getting settled in here. Got a few things to go over. Thought, uh, thought this one out a little bit. Uh, we will check in here, see who's, who's on board. that start in. Um, again, welcome. I am Larry Ellswick with Independent Angler. I am doing these uh, Wednesday night chat nights uh, to go over a few things. Uh, fly fishing. Talk about anything you want. There's Joe. Hey, Joe. Glad you could make it. Uh, first things first. Happy Earth Day. We are, well, this is the 50 years, started in 1970, so we, this is the 50 year anniversary of Earth Day, and that's pretty cool. Brought to you by the Earth and the Sun. Thanks, Joe. All right, uh, so let me get started. I do have a few things to go through. We'll let people uh, start trickling in. Um, a little bit of things to discuss regarding, yep, happy birthday, everybody. Um, yeah, weed guards. Um, that was brought up last week. I had tied, um, a couple of gurgler patterns and that was brought up and I really am not a fan of the weed guard. Um, there are two varieties that I'm most familiar with. I can't say that I've used them maybe once or twice. Um, I personally do not like them. Um, let me just show you. This is one variety. Single strand. You start in the back, loop it around the front. The key is to miss the point of the hook. And uh, a lot of times uh, it will keep you, the more you keep off the weeds, the, the harder it is, or the, the more likely you're going to miss a fish. So this is one variety, and I'll show you how to tie that here in a second. I recorded a couple of videos, and uh, we'll go through that. Um, this is the second variety. You can see there, it's actually a, a loop that's tied in the front. This is an easy one to add after the fact. You know, it's... Again, it, there's pros and cons. Now I'm going to go, I'll show you a couple videos while we're at it. And this, uh, I just recorded this a little bit earlier. I was looking for the uh, crookedest hook I could find. Occasionally a few don't make it in the package, so I uh, save them off to the side for practice hooks or you know, cut the barb off and use it for something else. So anyway, just uh, wrapping it in the back, starting there. This particular monofilament was a 12-pound test, just right off the spool. So you would actually start there and then start tying your fly, whether it's a hair bug or whatever. And then right when you get up to the front, you're ready to finish it. Uh, tie off the head or fin finish the last stacking of the, the hair. So the key is when you're wrapping it up to the front, you just want to miss that front point of the barb. You can see the closer you get it, the better, because uh, when a fish clamps on, you don't want you don't want that to uh, impede their uh, biting. But again, I. I tend to shy away from those. Um, yeah, I, the guards, to me, the, the way I fish is I, if there's a, imagine a big bunch of lily pads, 
the leaders might not be able to handle it if you were to just to cast in the middle of it. Uh, I would rather draw the fish out and just kind of hit right along the edge of the weeds. I'm, I'm pointing there to the uh, the loop in front of the hook. So that's uh, that was that one. And then this is the second one, the second variety. Um, so yeah, when I'm fishing, I just um, I try to avoid the weeds or just go slightly into them. And then if you hook into them, you just you know give it a tug and hopefully it, it flies off. But um, you know I I can imagine getting caught in the the middle and um, you know that fish is going to take it straight down in the the weeds and you're going to be wrapped around everything anyway. So I would prefer to maybe catch the ones or draw their attention if it's a you know a popping bug something that you can smack the water outside of the edge of the lily pads and, and bring them out so I have never I can safely say I've never said that gee I wish I had a weed guard today um, just something I tend to use without thinking about it hi Dan this is a little pre-recorded thing I did earlier just to show uh, weed guards that came up last week so this is the second variety. Um, yeah, I've already uh, messed up a couple things here. So it, the one thing I'm showing is when you do this one, you want to kind of make it a tight loop. As a matter of fact, I want to show you when I move my fingers. The uh, I've actually hooked it around the barb to gauge the distance to the eye of the hook. I'll get a couple wraps on there and then I'll pull away and then reposition it. It's getting all buggered up here. I'll cut off all that excess. There you go. Finally, gee, what's this guy doing? So imagine the fly's already tied and you you put it up to the front. Now, if that thing gets whopper jawed at any point, I'll show you here in a second. I'll, I'll finish this off. Couple wraps. A little fancy schmancy little doohickey there. Get rid of that. Now, you can see the idea is that I really should have put a couple wraps behind it. <laughs> but if that thing got out of place after you cast it, it hit the water, hit the weeds. See, now it's in front. And watch what I do here. Yeah, he's not happy. That will actually impede the fish from biting the, even getting into that gap. So that's one of the reasons. It's just a, you know, just, I've adjusted my style of fishing where I don't feel that I need to dive into the middle of a bunch of weeds or lily pads or that sort of thing. So that was my little show and tell on the weed guards from from last week so okay happy Earth Day again so you can see this is properly positioned when, when the fish would hit this it would push it up underneath but again if that pulls around to the front that could be disastrous so personal opinion so last week I also talked about my trout fly box. This is how I left it last year. I am up for plenty of suggestions. Um, I am not a primary trout fishing guy. I like to fish for anything that is out there to fish for. So uh, this is how I started. This is what I opened up last week and took a picture and put it out there. So the as you can see, the top row on the right has a few Cahills and um, sulfurs and whatnot. Um, the weeks that I typically go over to Pennsylvania for certain varieties of fish, um, or certain certain hatches are hatching, um, uh, um, and it's typically the gray fox. Uh, Quill Gordons and then into the March Browns which are a lot of fun. Those hatches are, are pretty excellent. That's a large, large mayfly uh, which is kind of right in the middle 
on the right side. And then I had a couple stimulators on down at the bottom. I got a nice rainbow over in Pennsylvania last fall uh, with the one without the legs. And then there's a whole gaggle of something over there on the right. And a little cricket on the bottom and some Hendrickson's and whatnot. And up at the top on the left, I had a bunch of, I got to say, these are purchased emergers for the March Brown. Again, it's that same week. I don't fish that a lot and I'm going to try to do more of that um, if the occasion if I can get out there this May um, for that particular hatch and on down on the left you can see my uh, my favorite row of caddisflies and some other very beat up old large mayfly believe it or not they they're productive there's some uh, rusty spinners in there and then the bottom row there's some flies that I purchased up in uh, Michigan for a trip up there and it was some Hendrickson's um, and a couple other flies that uh, I will show you in the next slide so with that being said this is my organization thus far and I'm going to take it the next step and, and actually fill in uh, some of the flies so as far as any type of order, like order of the hatch, I don't do it. I just kind of know what's what on each row. And um, I think I've come to grips with the fact I'm going to have one box for mayflies and mayfly emergers, and then the other box for the caddisflies and the life cycle thereof. Um, a couple flies to note on the left side. Um, there's some Patriot flies there in the middle right. I'm sorry, middle left. And I might be tying that next week. I'll show you one here in the upcoming slide. And some more March Browns and whatnot. So if anybody has any suggestions for organizing this mess, please let me know. How do you guys organize your fly boxes? Any particular way? Well, while I'm waiting for responses, let's uh, talk about the fly du jour for tonight. Uh, okay, Diane, Joe, you were. This is what I was tying last night. Um, that's a picture I took this morning, and um, there you go. It is a simple fly. It is not named to anyone. It emerged back in the uh, organized chaos nice what organization there you go so you can see where you know we're, we're right on the same page so other than tying more flies that's about as organized as I think I'm gonna get maybe split in the boxes but who knows so this is the uh, partridge in orange uh, tied with the Hungarian partridge uh, and orange thread two colors or two materials and it is one of the um, I don't want to say the best flies ever, but it's an excellent fly for searching and it imitates a lot of different things. When it gets wet, those um, barbs fold back and it gives it a nice buggy, buggy shape. So there again, that's uh, what I was tying. This is the, uh, that's what I was looking for last night and found. Um, the feathers are uh, tails at the bottom, heads at the top. Um, the feathers for this fly are from the shoulders and the back of the neck. You can see the variations. So if you want a darker uh, color, oh yeah, you can do this one, and it's uh, it's a good one. You you want to you want to do this one. Um, you can do it with other varieties of partridge. There are even some of the feathers on a pheasant that I'll pull out of a bag in a little bit that will imitate or you know change change the shade a little more iridescence but anyway that that's a that's a good good one to have in your repertoire is uh, some Hungarian partridge feathers now you can see this is where I was said I was going with it that's a March Brown emerger 
and what you're trying to imitate is that little wing coming out of the case and then as it's rising to the surface to hatch out it's kind of in a mess of it's not fully developed it's not a nymph so it's kind of in that mid stream but if you notice if you go back you still have that uh, nice shape of the barbs on that spider similar fly so you're only adding maybe the tail underwing and a little bit thicker body and a rib um, so it's, it's kind of a building thing so what I'd like to do is maybe simplify this even more back to more of the spider uh, partridge and orange style uh, this is uh, I tied this tonight beforehand this is what I, I'm gonna demonstrate it in a little bit um, I am trying to pull this one into uh, more of a caddis um, color. That's tied on a caddis hook, barbless. And uh, anyway, it's just nice little little coloration, nice little pattern. Okay. Yes, you can do this one. So here we go. And I have worked a little bit on my camera setup. So here we go. Say hi. She's learned to uh, root out my uh, decks and saddles. She chewed one up today. I was not happy. This is Trinity, everybody. Everybody say hi to Trinity. Thank you, Dan. All right. Enough of that. You go behave. Is that any better? Okay. So I'm using, for this particular fly, um, I tell you what, I will tie one first with just the standard thread and uh, thread body and partridge wing. And this is uh, like a 3761, it's just a wet, heavy shank hook. Standard length, and this one is barbless. Don't start barking at me. That won't be nice. Easy enough. Okay.
So this would be, traditionally, it would be done in silk. I'm using polyester, the other silk. It has a nice little sheen to it, and it'll look a little bit different in the water when it gets wet. So take it to the bend or to the point of the hook and then work it back. You see a lot of a lot of folks will add a, a rib to it or you know you could actually do this out of wire or ribbing or tinsel or a lot of things. It's it's a kind of the oldest form of fly of recent history. I think uh, I read today a little bit about it. It was like the mid 1800s when it was first published, this particular one. So I'll actually change color here. Because I want a black head. You could also use a uh, black marker at the end, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I took my black thread. There it is. Dog must have taken it. So here we go. Right behind the eye, leave yourself a little wrapping space. This fly is a sparse, very sparse fly. So I'll go up here and I'll probably take this like right in the middle section, up near the top. Uh, a lot of this is fluffy, but you're not going to go that far up into the feather. Okay. So what you want to do, if you can, without hackle pliers, You can grab, say, up here at the top, right at the end, and then just pull back from there. That way you can get as much as you can get up near the top, because that's the part you're going to tie in. Now, the other thing to remember, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with a lot of feather types, but the outside of the feather is cupped away. so. There is a direction on the feathers, so the outer part is the part that you want to be facing the front. So you actually you want that to curve back. So what you would do here is tie this in kind of in reverse. Okay. Get a couple wraps. Maybe wrap one in the front. And then you want to get rid of the tag. Piece. Okay, so then you can grab it with the uh, aqua pliers. And I don't know why, but um, I just wet my fingers a little bit. So I thought of, uh, remember old Gaylord Perry? It was the big spitballer back in the day. So, would you? Oop! I don't want to lose it. They got off track. Try it again. Okay, that's what. So a lot of times what what will happen is if you're messing around with the spool, you'll loosen that wraps on there. Get rid of that. I'll even put a half hitch on there just to hold it. So you want to fold it back as you go so that the threads will or the barbs will be pointing to the back as you go to the front and that's probably enough right there you don't want to overdress this fly 
So you'll get your wrap there. Got a couple in the front to post that up, and then I've seen the hot shots just pull that off. Look at me, I'm a hot shot. And then you tie that off, or get as much of a built up head on the front as you would like. And there you have it. So that is more or less the traditional method. Thread, silk if you want to be traditional. Um, Hungarian partridge, you see those nice little speckled legs. And that is on a number 12. So if I were to do these and have multiples, I would do a yellow, which is the partridge in yellow. And I would do um, the orange and uh, I would probably do a green just like this. Uh, I think the size is right for the a caddis. It might look like a case when it's laid back um, or some type of little worm with legs. Um, so I'm going to take this to the next step to kind of build my emerger. or build the kind of a caddis nymph looking thing. So I'm going to use this time a number 12. It's like a 206 barbless um, has kind of a built-in shape curve to it. Um, I don't know that there's, it's really so small of a, you know, it's how many wraps, it's, it's like 30 wraps of either one isn't going to be a whole lot of difference. Um, durability, the polyester is probably going to last a little bit longer, although silk is pretty darn strong. Um, the, it might come down to the glimmer in the water. Just the, the makeup of uh, synthetic um, against the natural. So that would be about the only thing I could um, gauge for that. I think a lot of times, in my case, it's always whatever I have around. I do have some uh, silk, and I think it's that old-timey stuff uh, for life of me couldn't find it to at least show um, but for now I'm using polyester um, rust would also be a good color and this was a material that I found in my stuff but it's uh, this is called uni stretch pumpkin it was actually a good good looking color so Uh, but I, I tried it, but I think thread is, is just as good. So for this one, I'm going to start with a little bit of green thread. And I'm going to mimic uh, maybe more of a caddis type critter. And instead of, because it's a little bit of a curve to the shank, I'm going to go a little bit farther around the bend, past the, oh, the uh, tip of the hook. There is no barb, so I can't say barb, but maybe back to where a barb would be. And I'm going to start back to the front.
Alright. This will be a straight uh, partridge wing. And again, you got you can see how that curves. That's the outside, that's the inside. So what you want is you want these to be laying back, swept back when you from the get-go. So um, this is where you would just find your stem if it helps, which I think I should at least demonstrate is just grab right on the end and you'll get as many of those as you can right up to the end. You don't want to be too stingy because um, I think I broke it the last time because I was right up to the end. So you want to give yourself a little bit of a some width to that stem. Now this one, I'm going to try it this way. I'm going to go to the front with my tie off, which somebody's taken my black thread. So you might, you know, want to start with thread before you tie in the feather. Okay. Curve to the back. Tie it in. So you're only looking at just like a sixteenth of an inch, a couple of millimeters from the eye. Get rid of that little clump of stuff. And because it has a tendency to roam, I'm going to put one little half hitch there. And kind of gauge where you want that legs to go, get rid of the fluffy stuff. Okay. Get your handy dandy knuckle pliers. Do the Gaylord Perry. Uh, I think it helps just to wet your fingers a little bit. Start the wrap to the front, and there you go. That's stingy. Oh, that didn't break at least. Let's try this again. Probably the trickiest part is just trying to, you can just wing it and wrap it, but I, I like to keep it at least consistent. I think you've heard me say just to keep it the same each time. So if you're doing a nice wrap to the back, try to maintain that consistency. Now you don't want to wrap it too far and lay those barbs back too far. You want them to be out horizontal, or I'm sorry, up and down vertical. That way, the w motion in the water will be to lay them back as it's pulled through the water. So there you have it. 
little more curve to the body, the nice length on the the barbs on the uh, the wing, the wet wing, and there you have it. So what else we got? Any questions on that one? I'll probably end up doing three, six of these in this color, in this variety. I'm going to do one more thing to this. I'm going to tie one more, and it's going to just have maybe a little bit of underbody. What you can do is you could put, um, well, what, what I'm going to do is put dubbing in front of the wing so that the wing will actually lay across that and create a little more color and separation between the body and what would be a thorax if it were an actual insect imitation. And then you could also put a bead behind the wing or a bead in front of the wing. So just like with anything else, like the woolly bugger, um, you could modify this accordingly. So on the next one, I'm going to do this. Same size, same everything. This will be a uh, uh, what size was this? What did I say? 12. Number 12. Same everything except I'm going to add a little bit of dubbing for the thorax. Alright? Definitely a trout fly. Yep. Been used for ever. If you fish in tandem, uh, you could put a nice big, uh, maybe a well-dressed caddis fly above it, maybe with legs in the works, and then uh, drop this down behind it. So if the fish are moving and you see some activity, uh, and then you know tie this off behind it, and then see which ones uh, the fish are biting on the most. So there you have that. I'm keeping an eye on my black thread in case. I think the dog's taking it. She's found a liking to my. Necks. So this will give just a little bit of shape to the body by going back in a little curve. Use that natural curve. And these are very, very sharp, these barbless hooks. You get a lot deeper penetration when you do catch the fish because they are sharp. If you get the wraps nice and tight, you get a little bit of segmentation. So I'm going to stop a little bit closer or further back. was the same dubbing I used uh, a couple weeks ago. As a matter of fact, I might do a little bit different technique. Pick the amount that I want, and what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to split 
the thread. And because I already threw a half hitch in it, that will allow me to finagle it a little bit. So you can see I've taken the one strand and split it into two. Then I'm going to kind of lay that glob in there. So this will be a little bit, see how that worked? A little bit clumpier. So it'll be a little bushier. So as it's fished, it'll kind of break apart and might look more like that wing case coming out of the the wing body yes especially when I'm gonna do little things like wrapping that uh, or splitting it and I do want to just kind of keep it and there's no while it says you can't throw a half hitch on there or do something just to keep it from moving. I mean, it's frustrating if you don't and it starts unwrapping on you. So it's a little bit of a mental health, right? So I am going to change colors. And if I had a Sharpie handy, I would maybe just paint this a little bit different. So done with the green. I'm going to start the black and then she don't want to be frustrated. It's the last thing you want. And it's sparse. I know another thing, and I, I kind of tore this one, but I think I'm going to go with it. I'm going to peel off all of them from one side. That'll just give it a nice thinner profile. So you want it to lay to the back. So I'm gonna tie it in right by the dub. I go ahead and get rid of that fuzz because that's just one less thing that you need to do at the end. One less thing to get in the way. Okay. In the process, I pulled that out, but we'll do it again. Has anybody else found that washing their hands all the time is really uh, <laughs> wreaking havoc on the, the old feelers? I dropped that one. There we go. All right, I'm not having good luck with that one. Starting over. What's nice about where these feathers are and this clump across the shoulders be behind the neck is that they're all very consistent as far as the length and size. Um, it's not like a hackle neck that's going to be you know, you're pulling different sections, different sizes from different parts of the neck, so. So I'm actually going to pre-trim, 
get up to where that stem is a little bit longer. The curve to the back. You guys understand that, right? The curve to the back. See how I'm folding them to the back and they are cooperating a little bit. And Just give it a nice finished head to it. So I'm going to work on that one. All right. Same thing. Uh, as far as the the smell, it 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 could very well be superstition, but um, I bet a sharpie's probably at the end of the day a whole lot less than, say, uh you know, whatever VOCs are in the head cement. And then I have, I kind of whipped up my own uh, water-based variety that seems to work as well as anything else. So that's going to be less VOC on that as well. So even uh, not the best resolution on this camera, but you can see, um, you know, that's got a nice profile, and you can imagine that wet it back you know and when you're walking and you're waiting and you know you know if you're, you've done your homework before you step in the water you've lifted up a couple of rocks but you can see the what worms uh, are, are under the rocks like the little rock worms or the, the caddis larva if they're cased you know that could look like a case that's kind of broken apart and fish know when things are moving through the water because it, that, we, you do churn things up. A lot of times you'll catch fish down below you because all of a sudden, you know, 30 feet upstream, something's been moved, and then all this food starts, you know, kicking up from, from being under the rock. So it's a legitimate uh, argument that stuff gets roughed up and the fish see it and they're, uh, they're into it. So there you go. Uh, any other questions on this? I'm going to head back over. I will not, Joe, on this. It's just me. You can, if you like. Personal preference. Always just, regardless, make sure you put a good knot on the end. A whip finish or a half hitch in my book. Okay? 
All right. All right. Moving back. Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. Um, it's been a busy week. Uh, I decided um, there are actually a couple other flies I was going to work on. That is a uh, Norvice. I don't know. Can you see more of it in that picture? You know what a Norvice is, right? Yeah, there you go. So that's the rotating one. Actually, cool. So you can imagine, uh, like, if you've ever seen the demonstration or go to their website to make dubbing on this, it's it's rock star. It is totally the bomb. So there's no real advantage. Um, the idea is when that rotates, notice that um, top is in line so if you put your hook shank I just use it like a normal vise but if you put your hook shank level with the top and spin it you could actually run a, a thread up you can uh, you know make the dubbing and um, it, it's on it's just like a lathe let's put it that way <clears throat> if you go to Norvice probably norvice.com um, there's a bunch of videos or just YouTube but um, it's pretty cool I bought that years ago I love it um, it's just a little bit different setup as far as how you how you set it up on your your desk but uh, I love it if you want one I can get you, get one for you So, all right, I'm going to conclude here. Fly boxes. We talked about fly boxes, why Larry doesn't like weed guards, and uh, I'm going to go through my memes of the week and um, what I'm going to tie next week and perhaps talk about. I'm wrapping this uh, April fiasco up next week. It'll be the fourth one, and I'm going to really try to promote it and I might actually try to sell a couple things. I've, I've kind of eased off on uh, hitting people over the head with uh, wanting to sell stuff, um, but I will highlight a couple of my uh, vendors, such as uh, Chad at CF River Products and his nets, and uh, some of the other folks that uh, might need a little business this time of year. So, you ready for this? This one was sent to me uh, by uh, Terry Griner from last week. He, he sent this one to me. So that was number three on the list. Number two this week, another 80s reference. Google it if you need to. And last but not least, the ever so popular A River Runs Through It.
which reminds me, did I uh, did I put that one in here? <clears throat> I don't think I put it in here. Yeah, I took a picture of my mop fly. Anyway, yeah, I, I I used a mop fly for the first time last year, and uh, of course I did well with it. And uh, it's just a matter of, you know, if you want to be more like Paul and be the purist, which, uh, you know, I always try to strive for uh, getting better each time I go. So, uh, next week. Now, Diane, I know you tried this a couple weeks ago. Um, this is one that I... It was about the third one I tied to get it right. Um, I we had actually a group of us went up to uh, Chad's cabin up in um, uh, up near Lovells and Grayling, uh, Michigan, and uh, we caught several fish on this. As a matter of fact, the morning yeah, it was the year prior, but the morning that I went um, by myself. Chad took me, uh, I went down to the creek behind the cabin with this fly that he gave me, and uh, right off the bat I caught a nice little brook trout, and uh, the Patriot fly is excellent fly for brook trout, and uh, he made a believer out of me, so I'm going to try to tie up a few of these, maybe try them over in Pennsylvania, and uh, I am definitely going to try to get up and hang out with Chad this summer, so if anybody wants to put a trip together, let me know. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll practice up on that one, and uh, we can tie. So if you have the materials, uh, we can do that one. So all right, how do we do? Right about an hour. Excellent. Try to keep them uh, at a decent time. Lengthwise. So here we go. I'm going to. Transition to the end slides and uh, say good night, happy Earth Day. Go out there and catch some fish. I think it's going to warm up this week. And I will talk to you later. Bye.